Hello. We're here today because people around the world have been forced to learn many difficult lessons during the COVID-19 pandemic. But perhaps the most unexplored one is about the issue of isolation. More than a quarter of the U.S. population lives alone. That's more than 95 million people. So with the pandemic mandating quarantines and social distancing, America is being forced to reckon with yet another public health crisis, and that would be loneliness. The ramifications of isolation can be devastating, and they can result in some fairly serious physical and mental disturbances, and it can even shorten lifespans. Some research suggests that the negative impact of isolation even rivals that of obesity. So the central question that we're seeking to answer in this conversation is, how can things like social services, architecture, infrastructure, and more offer us some solutions that can nurture human connection and possibly avert yet another public health emergency? So we're gonna start this conversation with Emiliana Simon Thomas. She's the science director at the University of California, Berkeley's Cent a Greater Good Science Center. And in part, her work focuses on the key roles that social connection, support and belonging play in our overall well-being. So Emiliana, could you start off this discussion by giving us some insight into what the term social connection actually means and how COVID-19 may be sort of disrupting that in our society. Sure, thank you, Rachel. When I think about social connection, it starts with trust in humanity, the sense that when you encounter other people out in the world, they're not considered threats or immediately rivals, but rather someone who you may have some commonality with, someone who may be a cooperator, may participate in a collective endeavor with you. The second part of social connection is uh, our sense of belonging, the way that we feel like we play a meaningful role in the communities that we live within, the ways that others value us and turn to us for support when they need help with whatever they're struggling with. And then third is, is having support ourselves, knowing that there's someone that we can count on. When the World Happiness Report uh, studies or assesses social connection, it's just through one question. And the question is along the lines of, if you are going through a difficult time, do you have someone to count on to help you, yes or no? And as you alluded to, it's quite troubling how many people end up selecting no in response to that question. You know, one of my recent National Geographic stories uh, was a photo feature about an 80-year-old woman in Brooklyn who is almost thriving during the pandemic because she's made a point of checking on her neighbors, of uh, making sure that our elderly neighbors have their groceries, their friends, and that they at least get some sort of visit or contact with her, even though their families can't be with them. Now, you believe that, that COVID is really stripping us of these kinds of interactions in, in unprecedented ways, and that these connections are crucial to our basic humanity. So why do you think that we need to be a lot more deliberate about the interactions that we do have? And so, give us some ways that we can do that. Yeah, I mean, before the pandemic and before social distancing mandates, most of us spent time walking around either at our workplaces, at the educational institutions where either we were going or our children were going, uh, in stores, uh, in, in a variety of locations where we interacted with people, people we knew, people we didn't know, and all of those inter um, sort of uh, just incidental points of contact are instructive to our nervous system. Our nervous system is, is tracking the world for potential threats and potential opportunities. And when we encounter other people or situations that are not threatening, and I would describe those incidental interactions where you pass someone and nothing bad happens as a non-threatening social interaction, our nervous system keeps track and we become comfortable in the environment that we're in. We experience what's called psychological safety, 
We, uh, we navigate in ways that explore novel opportunities, and all of this is so important to our health and well being. When we don't have those opportunities because either we're staying home, we are masking appropriately, but perhaps also turning our faces away from one another in an effort to preserve everyone's safety. Um, we're just not getting that signal. We're not getting that passive, regular signal that says you belong, you're safe, and you're part of this, this species, or you're part of humanity, and what you do matters. So what we need to do to correct for that is be deliberate. Um, we can still speak to people in friendly and uh, engaging ways if we're lucky enough to be able to go to the supermarket with our masks on with all other safety precautions we can still say hello we can still remark on somebody's clothing or uh, ask them a question about how their day was we can engage in this small talk to sort of correct for what's being taken away by the by the lifestyle changes that we've had to make again this just gives us that sense of belonging community and interpersonal trust that we, we got for free before Speaking of the issue of seniors, obviously so much of the, the news coverage of the impact of COVID-19 has been on uh, seniors and the senior population. And uh, it's, it's sort of centered on seniors living in nursing home settings and the fact that they're isolated from each other and their family members aren't allowed to visit. So it's really yielded some, some heartbreaking stories. But now we're going to shift to Brian Geyser, who can talk with us about this, this particular population and this issue. Brian is the Chief Clinical Officer at Inspire and the Vice President for Clinical Innovation and Population Health at the Maplewood Senior Living uh, Community in Westport, Connecticut. So Brian, you share that you want to offer us the perspective from the senior living industry, specifically independent living facilities, assisted living and memory care communities. So I wonder if you could start by telling us how those communities differ from skilled nursing facilities. Sure, uh, thank you. I, you know, so skilled nursing facilities are, are generally uh, reserved for people who need very high levels of skilled care um, uh, or coming out of the hospital and need uh, short term rehabilitation. Um, you know, generally uh, skilled nursing facilities, almost all of them accept Medicare and Medicaid, so they're federally funded. Uh, they also accept other insurances, but they're, you know, the, essentially regulated by the federal government where, and they're, they're more clinical environments. Uh, skilled nursing facilities uh, have uh, also called rehabilitation facilities have done a, a good job over, over the years of trying to declinicalize their environments and make them a little bit more like a uh, home. Uh, but they're, they're definitely a, a more of a medical model. Uh, and that's compared to uh, assisted living or independent living for older adults. Uh, that is a, more of a residential model. Uh, and interestingly, you know, it's more, it's more of a home setting in an assisted living community or an assisted living residence. Um, and uh, in assisted living uh, over the years, assisted living has actually gotten better at bringing in uh, uh, healthcare services into their communities. So where skilled nursing facilities are really healthcare environments at their core, and they try to be a little bit more like home, um, assisted living is more like a residential environment at their core, um, bringing in healthcare services uh, and, and non-medical services. Uh, so, so people can get assistance with things like personal care and activities of daily living. Um, so they're, 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 they're different in that way. Um, it doesn't mean that you wouldn't have people who need uh, nursing care who live in assisted living. Uh, the Inspire building that we're almost completing, uh, we're nearing completion on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, will we'll have an array of services available to residents um, from you know, personal care services all the way up through skilled nursing services there. Uh, but the key there is that really it's about, it's about lifestyle for residents, it's about socialization, it's about connectivity and engagement. Uh, and we have an entire team of people who every day deliver uh, you know, uh, exciting, fun, engaging programs to our residents. 
uh, at, at the same time delivering health care and keeping residents safe in the age of COVID-19. One of my personal opinion is one of the most underreported stories is the issue of depression in the elderly. I think it's that greatest generation where we, we feel that some of the things that we might do in terms of therapy or medication even is something that is not even, um, wouldn't even be considered by this population. But one of the ways that your company or your organization has been able to combat this issue of loneliness and isolation has been through the use of technology. So can you tell us a bit about uh, one in particular, the Timmy Robot Program? Tell us about that. Sure. Uh, you know, we, we spend a lot of time thinking about how to keep our residents engaged and connected. Uh, and technology is one of the ways that we can do that. Uh, so uh, just prior to the onset of the pandemic, we held a, an event at the 92Y actually with Seth Rogen and his charity, Hilarity for Charity. And while we were uh, and at that event, we had uh, these two Temi robots that we had uh, kind of roaming around, interacting with the crowd. And uh, they were there to uh, register people and, and do some other some other things. And we, you know, we thought that they were kind of cool. Uh, and then, uh, but we hadn't really thought about using them in our in our assisted living and senior living communities. But uh, the, then the pandemic hit, and everything sort of changed. And we we immediately formulated a COVID nineteen task force that uh, was was tasked with solving some of the major problems, not just the health and safety issues, but issues around um, loneliness and isolation in our assisted living environments. And uh, we, we kind of hearkened back to our event at the 92Y with those Temi robots. And we thought, is there something we can do with those robots to, uh, to address this issue of, of loneliness and isolation with our residents who are all gonna be on lockdown and quarantine for their own safety? So uh, we, we quickly investigated this and then ultimately ended up purchasing a Temi robot for each one of our uh, 14 assisted living communities that we operate in three different states. And then we also purchased one for each floor of the Inspire Towers. We have uh, 23 Temis in the Inspire building. So those Temis, uh, what they do is they've helped us with a few things. One, uh, they, we use them for entertainment so they can be, uh, they can wheel right into a resident's apartment who's on quarantine and we can, um, we can entertain the residents with activities and programs right on the Temi robot. We also use it for connectivity to family, friends, um, and others, uh, on the Temi, the residents can just be sitting comfortably in their apartment. The Temi can go in and they, and the residents can talk to their families or loved ones right on the robot. Um, and they don't have to, uh, you know, use a tablet or any any device at all. Uh, they don't have to hold anything in their hand. It's just it just wheels in, and there's your daughter on the screen. It uh, sounds amazing, and and in fact, this is a, a terrific segue into our next speaker, who is one of the most renowned uh, researchers and scientists in in the country around this issue. Maya Matarik is an American. Uh, computer scientist and roboticist at the University of Southern California. And uh, she actually is known for developing the field of socially assisted robotics. She's a, a, one of the pioneers in that field. So Maya, why don't you give us an overview of what the field of socially assisted robotics is? I think you may be on mute. Apologies. So I'm thrilled to see that from the practical side, people are discovering robotics because we have spent the last decade and a half pioneering this field. And the idea is in the name. Socially assisted robotics means that robots are assisting people through social means, not physical ones. So when people think about robots, they think about physical work, right? They're going to do dirty, dull, and dangerous things. But we actually want them to serve as companions to people when people don't have anyone else around them. And so it's really complementary to what you just heard Brian talk about. Um, the robots he talked about are really telepresence. So you have a robot that comes over to a person and it maybe shows the face of their loved one from a distance. We, we want something more than that. We want the robot to, in a sense, become a loved one that can always be there when no one else can. So it's to augment the, the family, if you will, especially now during COVID, people are just feeling the lack of someone who is there for them daily to just come by and say, how are you feeling? How, how are you doing? Here, you know, hold my hand. 
So we have been doing studies for the last decade and a half, and this is now taken off as a field. The National Institutes for Health have actually funded it for Alzheimer's patients, um, looking at how we can actually improve health outcomes that are related to mitigating isolation and depression. And so it's a very, very powerful technology. And the important point is that it's designed specifically to augment and supplement and enhance what people care, what human people caregivers can do. So it's very important to keep in mind that this is not to replace human caregivers, but the job of caring for the elderly and especially those um, with Alzheimer's is very, very demanding. And uh, it's just, there is a, a rule there for something else in addition to human care that could take a little bit of a load off so that the individual can always have someone or something to support them. That's the goal. My yeah, this is fascinating, and as I did the research and looked into your work, it was just uh, jaw-dropping. But I wonder if there was a moment as the headlines around COVID-19 began to get worse and mount uh, that you really re realized that your work in this field that you focus so much time on could make a significant impact in terms of responding to COVID-19. There was, in fact, a moment because uh, my mother-in-law was in an Alzheimer's care facility and she passed away right before COVID. And I just had this realization. I thought, well, you know, if she had lived, I could not have visited her. None of us could have visited her. And, and there would have been a small cadre of staff, some of whom would have gotten sick. And so who would have been there for her? And this just reinforced in a very real way what we've been doing in research for a decade and a half. You know, if everybody had a robot, and the other thing that people told me a lot was, oh gosh, now if we did have such a robot in the homes of the elderly, not only could we encourage them to, to stand up, to walk around, to connect with others, which we have done, but also we can encourage them to put on that mask, to pull it over the nose a little bit more because it tends to kind of be too low, you know, to help them with these daily activities, which are now expanded because your activities of daily life now include wearing a mask and washing your hands more often and putting sanitizer on, these are all things that we need some support with, some encouragement. Emiliana, let's go back to you. And, and I, your research helps us to think about how COVID-19 is really creating a source of chronic stress for everyone. No one can escape this. And particularly when it comes to the issue of social distancing and having to make decisions about whether I'm going to see my, my cousin who's sick or the new baby who was born or whether I can even go into my office. So how can people try to be intentional about managing their, their daily thoughts, you know, the, the, the rabbit wheel or the hamster wheel rather of stress and as, as these issues build up, how can we pivot away from that and maybe think about gratitude and optimism? Yeah, I mean, I think it starts with recognizing that hamster wheel and dwelling on what are the sources of my anxiety? What am I thinking about all the time that is causing that stress and that worry? And I think what it boils down to in these days is massive uncertainty, uncertainty about the future, uncertainty about the present, uncertainty about information, coupled with um, just an onslaught of threatening news, right? Every moment there's another story, another headline that really makes us feel like we're completely out of control of the situation. We can't really know what to do next or how to help. And I think this combination of, again, the information we're getting and our tendency to notice the things that are threatening and harmful presents a real challenge. We actually need to, as you noted, uh, deliberately and intentionally engage in activities that draw our attention into other directions. And so that we're, mindfulness is so important. Um, personally, I, I watch faulty towers and British sitcoms to I refuse to have a steady intake of, of news. But mindfulness can be difficult for some people. Absolutely. And sometimes it's just breathing. Sometimes it's just taking a moment to take a deep breath and put your hand on your heart. And you can say to yourself, 
things are going to get better at some point. And this doesn't mean putting your head in the sand and pretending that nothing is bad. It simply means adopting an optimistic perspective that is a foundation for any forward momentum. It can retain that sense of hope that anything that you do on a given day can contribute even in the small ways that we're capable to making the world a better place. So I'm not gonna solve COVID-19. I'm not gonna restore equality and justice to the world. That's not something I have the power to do today and now, but the work that I do in the little ways that I can is useful and valuable. And these achievements are important. And so honoring that, recognizing that, connecting what I do with something that I value, that's meaningful, that brings me a sense of purpose. All of that is restorative and, and sort of in, induces this, this certainty about why we're here and, and what we're meant to do that is sort of being chipped away at by the consequences or the circumstances that we're all facing. We've got about 10 minutes to go, but I'd love to have Brian tell us a little bit more about the new senior living residents that is will be opening soon on the Upper East Side in, in New York. Tell us how you've been able to prepare the staff, protect the staff and the residents and keep people socially engaged. Yes, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, we, we've been working from the beginning of the pandemic to put together different uh, policies, protocols, uh, approaches to, to managing these, you know, managing community transmission of virus within our communities trying to balance out autonomy and safety, freedom and ability to move about. Uh, it's, really a, it's really a challenge. Um, and then we, of course, uh, we have regulatory bodies that oversee some of our stuff. So we might have the governor issue an executive order saying, you gotta shut it down and you can't have, have visitors. Well, then that, that has a dramatic impact on the mental health of our, of our residents who can't physically be in touch with their families. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we have to come up with creative ways to keep people engaged when that happens. Uh, luckily, over the past few months, uh, things have been a little better and we've been able to open up our communities and have people in. Um, so I think pe keeping people connected to each other and keeping people engaged in community, engaged with activity, keeping them mobile, keeping them uh, hydrating, eating good foods, um, staying connected with one another, um, checking on them on a regular basis, making sure their families understand how they're doing. Um, all of these are the things that we do every single day. In terms of the question about staff and keeping them safe, uh, lots of training and education, uh, making sure that we have the proper PPE for all of our staff on a regular basis, keeping them educated on uh, how, to, how to manage um, you know, their, own, their own safety in, in our environments, uh, make, make sure that the residents are safe and family members who come to visit and anyone else who visits our communities are safe. Um, so it's constant education, constant communication. Um, it's sourcing PPE from all over the world. We've spent, you know, the past six months making sure that we have the appropriate equipment to keep our staff safe. And it's really, uh, it really comes down to uh, a couple of simple things, masks, testing, uh, social distancing and hand hygiene. Th those four things are so critical. And, um, and luckily we've been able to source testing uh, for all of our staff on a regular basis. We get them tested uh, every, every two weeks or every week, depending on the situation in the, in the local environment. Um, and it's very expensive for us to do that, but it's the right thing to do. And it's really helped us identify uh, cases, um, you know, not uh, asymptomatic positive uh, staff members that are just out there in the world doing the same things we're all doing, shopping and going to the gas station. And they pick this up and if they bring it into our buildings, it can be a real big problem as we've seen in, in the he in headlines. So the testing and the uh, identification of anyone who's walking around asymptomatic positive and removing that person from the building, doing the contact tracing, uh, isolating anyone who may have been infected, this is something that we do all the time, uh, every day, and uh, and it's been very effective. So important uh, aspects of it, and I think the contact tracing piece in in particular is is just something that we haven't done enough of. But as we wind down, I really would love to have Maya address a couple of issues quickly. One would be that of the digital divide, 
And so COVID has also accentuated the fact that there, it is real and it does exist even in the U.S. So talk about the availability of these kinds of technologies on a broad basis, but then ultimately can technology do an efficient job of replacing this, this very essential need for connection? Uh, you're on with you. Let me actually lead with the second question because I think it's so fundamental. Um, I don't believe, even as a technologist all my life, uh, that technology can or should try to replace um, human relationships. And when that does happen, we see very negative uh, behavioral and, and health outcomes. So that is not the goal. Uh, the goal really is to what I often call a bridge to care gap. So there's a gap in care that people need, both in sort of just hours in a day that they need support. Um, that is just not there, that is not met. And I think that's where technology needs to step in. Technology needs to help both the caregivers and those receiving care. And so we need a real ecosystem of different technologies, but they will not and cannot replace people. And in fact, I still would love to see much more support uh, for training and compensation of caregivers, because that is a, a speaking of the divide, that's a big problem. We don't have enough support and appreciation for, for those people. And they would love some technology to help them as well. So, um, but back to your other incredibly important question as well. So the digital divide, uh, you know, look at these poor kids uh, using, you know, wireless in front of Starbucks and, and, you know, getting, you know, sent off. So yes, the digital divide is widening. Uh, the technologies that, that I've talked about are actually quite inexpensive, but again, not to people who cannot afford a cell phone. So we can create robots today that cost just a, a few hundred dollars which is very, very cheap for a robot. If you go back to 10 years ago, we we're talking thousands. Now we're in the hundreds. So that number can definitely become much, much cheaper. But you're absolutely right. If someone cannot afford a cell phone, then you know, even if we get the robots in the realm of that price, um, it, there's still a divide. And that is something that, that's a societal challenge that we really need to bridge first and foremost. Well, when we think about the issue of optimism and particularly as it pertains to what we've been discussing. Emiliana, I, I, from your research, it seems that you're s suggesting that there is an opportunity that we have to learn from what's happening during COVID-19, to really look within ourselves and dig a little deeper. So why don't we sort of take this conversation in that direction as we close down? Sure. So one of the ideas that I teach is called grit. And grit is that quality of a person that is associated with achieving a goal or making progress or realizing a dream. And it comes from passion and perseverance. And passion and perseverance really happen because of that belief, that hope that whatever effort I put forth is going to lead to the aspired or desired outcome. Uh, I am capable if I work hard and apply myself, I will get there. This isn't to pretend that we don't live in a meritocracy that disadvantages certain people, but it does certainly point to the um, role that our own uh, perceptual frame in terms of possibility for the future plays and our capacity to learn. We have to learn from our setbacks, we have to take these failures as opportunities to grow and improve upon the lives that we are living right now. And, and I, I do believe that, that the constellation of difficult circumstances that we're surviving through right now all present opportunities for us to think deeply, reevaluate, and figure out how to grow and learn for the future. In our final minute, I'd love to I, I tell Brian that the image of seniors really interacting with the technology and benefiting from it is gives me an incredible amount of inspiration about flexibility and resiliency. So I, why don't you sort of let us know what message we can take from that in our final minute here. Well, look, I, I, I agree with Maya that, um, that, you know, humans and robots have to live, live in, in harmony together. We can't, we can't expect robots to do everything for us uh, or technology for that matter uh, at all. We've got to be there for our, our loved ones who are isolated, uh, our seniors in particular, they need us and, uh, and they deserve to have, uh, have people like us uh, out there helping them. So uh, 
I would implore all of us to pick up the phone and call your grandparents, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, call, call, call an elderly loved one uh, and, and sign up for, you know, that those volunteer services that, that reach out to seniors in our, in our cities and our communities uh, and, and, and get in front of them. They need us out there. This has been an incredibly informative and impactful conversation for me. And so I'd like to thank each of you for taking time to give us a window into what we need to be thinking about as uh, this issue of isolation and loneliness only expands. But there is room for optimism and there is room for us to be hopeful that there are some responses being developed. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, thank Rachel. You. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you.